Starship Flight 9 is closer than ever, possibly even happening this week. This will be an incredibly exciting launch, featuring the first return of a used Super Heavy booster from the previous Flight 7, paving the way for an era of reusability for the world's largest rocket. However, after all, this flight will mark the end of the line for this rocket. It will splash down in the ocean. Why isn't SpaceX recovering this booster? How will SpaceX carry out the booster splashdown method? Let's find out on today's episode of Alpha Tech. Before diving into the soft landing efforts for Super Heavy, we should first understand where SpaceX stands in its preparations for Flight 9. Most recently, on Thursday morning, SpaceX made rapid progress with its vehicle hardware by conducting a static fire test, producing a signature orange exhaust plume that was impossible to miss. The burn lasted approximately eight seconds. This was the first time SpaceX tested a flight-proven Super Heavy booster, paving the way for this particular rocket, known as Booster 14, to fly again soon. SpaceX has confirmed that Booster 14, which previously launched and returned to Earth in January, will be reused in the next Starship flight. With Thursday's static fire test, Booster 14 now appears to be the closest to flight readiness among all boosters at the SpaceX facility which sits just a short distance from the launch site. SpaceX quickly tweeted about the test, sharing fiery footage along with the message, Static Fire of the Super Heavy, preparing to launch Starship's ninth flight test. This booster previously launched and returned on Flight 7 and 29 of its 33 Raptor engines are flight proven. This not only gives insight into the condition of Booster 14's Raptor engines, but also shows that there were no serious issues following the test. It's truly impressive to see a reused rocket perform so smoothly during testing. Elon Musk was also eager to share the test and teased an upcoming launch date. First reflight of the Starship Super Heavy rocket booster coming up soon. Although no exact date has been officially announced, as usual, when Elon Musk makes such a confident statement, it usually means we won't have to wait much longer for the launch. Of course, we can't ignore the prediction from some space enthusiasts pointing to April 18th. But what about your guess? Drop a comment and let us know. After all, the successful reflight of a Super Heavy booster would mark a major milestone for the Starship program, bringing SpaceX closer to its ambitious goals for the year. However, what's surprising is that neither the company nor Elon Musk plans to recover Booster 14 after its next flight. Instead, they intend to land it in the ocean. But wait, wouldn't it make more sense, especially from a development perspective, to recover Booster 14 intact? Why not study it and reuse it again for future flights? Well, I bet many people would think that's the best approach, but let's not forget that SpaceX is always backed by engineers with brilliant minds. They make decisions like this for some reasons, and remember that 87% of the Raptor engines in this launch are being reused, which could also be one of the reasons why SpaceX engineers prioritize protecting ground infrastructure. Even if the static fire test was successful, there's still a 2% risk of something going wrong. If anyone wonders about collecting data from the massive Super Heavy, the company will surely proceed with recovering the wreckage from a pre-designated location. There will undoubtedly be images or videos of what remains of Booster 14 for us to marvel at, captured by cameras set up by the company. But what if Super Heavy explodes after landing in the ocean, as it did in some previous launches? Is the data collected really worth the trade-off of a potentially destroyed booster? To answer this question, we need to understand how the Super Heavy booster landing process actually works. Following stage separation, the Super Heavy booster initiates a sequence of maneuvers to facilitate its return. This typically involves a flip maneuver to orient the booster for a boost backburn, during which several of its Raptor engines are reignited to propel it back toward the launch site. If a towering catch is not attempted, or if the attempt is aborted due to safety or technical reasons, the booster continues on a trajectory that will lead to a controlled water landing in a designated area, most frequently the Gulf of America. The crucial phase of the splashdown procedure is the landing burn. During this phase, a subset of the Raptor engines, typically the inner 13 which possess gimballing capabilities, are reignited. These engines fire to significantly reduce the booster's descent velocity and to precisely control its trajectory for a vertical landing on the surface of the water. Aerodynamic control surfaces, specifically the four grid fins situated on the booster's interstage, 
play a vital role in guiding and steering the massive vehicle as it descends through the Earth's atmosphere. These fins, acting like rudders on an aircraft, allow for adjustments in the booster's orientation and descent path. In the final moments before making contact with the water, the Raptor engines continue to fire, further decelerating the booster to achieve what SpaceX aims for as a soft splashdown. This controlled reduction in impact velocity is intended to minimize damage to the booster. However, despite these efforts, reports indicate that after splashdown, the super heavy booster often tips over due to its horizontal instability in water. Furthermore, instances of explosions occurring after the booster has splashed down have been documented. These explosions are likely attributed to the ignition of residual liquid oxygen and methane propellants remaining within the booster's tanks. To mitigate potential hazards from a floating intact booster, SpaceX has also indicated a plan to intentionally sink the vehicle by opening its vents and valves to flood the tanks. The level of control exhibited during the booster's landing burn, even when the intended outcome is a splashdown, underscores the sophisticated capabilities of the Raptor engines and SpaceX's advanced flight control systems. The ability to precisely throttle and gimbal the engines allows for fine-tuned adjustments to the booster's rate of descent and its flight path, which is essential for both a successful tower catch and a controlled water landing. The very intention to achieve a soft splashdown suggests a degree of precision that goes beyond simply allowing the booster to fall uncontrolled into the ocean. The reported instances of post-splashdown explosions indicate that managing the remaining propellant within the booster is a significant challenge that SpaceX is likely actively addressing through design modifications and operational procedures. Indeed, as we've seen, achieving a controlled landing and maintaining the structural integrity of the Super Heavy booster is clearly something SpaceX is striving for. Hopefully, during Starship Flight 9, we'll witness Booster 14 being recovered from the ocean like a gift from Earth, ushering in a new chapter for the Starship program. However, all the points mentioned above still aren't the only reasons that led SpaceX engineers to decide on a splashdown landing. In fact, the traditional splashdown method carries additional general advantages. Water, with its nurturing and cushioning properties, creates a gentle buffer, an inviting environment that absorbs a significant portion of the impact force. That's the secret behind the concept of a soft landing. Therefore, when Starship splashes down in the ocean, if the descent is controlled and properly guided, it is highly likely that the spacecraft's structural integrity will remain intact, allowing SpaceX to expedite the recovery process. The ocean's natural softness acts as a shock absorber, protecting the spacecraft from the otherwise punishing forces of re-entry. Another major reason SpaceX isn't using the Mechazilla catch tower to recover Starship is the need to protect ground infrastructure. Any serious malfunction with a reused Booster 14 could have devastating consequences. For instance, additional hardware around the launch pad could face major setbacks if damaged. It's safe to say that SpaceX's confidence in landing Falcon 9 boosters has inspired iterative designs where the vehicle can automatically guide itself back to a landing zone using grid fins and thrust vectoring. But there's no denying that Starship is an entirely different beast, a beast sure to bring surprises. Even though it's now a thing of the past, we can't help but remember Starship's first launch with Super Heavy, igniting with a fiery roar from 33 Raptor engines, producing nearly 17 million pounds of thrust, resulting in a dramatic excavation of the launch pad. Only then can one truly grasp the destructive potential of the Starship Super Heavy system. So, given the massive scale of Super Heavy, just how severe could the damage be? When nearly empty, except for a small reserve of landing fuel. The biggest concern, in my opinion, is the risk of the booster veering off course and causing irreversible damage to the launch tower or pad infrastructure. With its enormous mass and extreme landing velocity, it has the potential to inflict catastrophic, irreparable harm. It would be a tragic sight to see the launch tower destroyed in such a way. Alongside the Super Heavy booster landing, SpaceX is also planning a soft ocean landing for Ship 35, during the upcoming Starship Flight 9 mission, one of the key maneuvers being tested is the belly flop, where the spacecraft flips and re-enters Earth's atmosphere with its underside facing downward. This technique allows for a controlled descent and landing similar to how a skydiver lands. 
To simulate the conditions of this maneuver, SpaceX has decided to let Starship splash down into the ocean. This will allow them to test the spacecraft's ability to manage re-entry, maintain control during descent, and preserve structural integrity under the intense forces of atmospheric return. This is important because orbital re-entry test flights don't begin with near-vertical up-and-down trajectories like the original prototype hops. Even those earlier hops were far more challenging than simple engine tests. During orbital re-entry, the spacecraft is moving laterally at full orbital velocity. To safely return, re-entry must begin somewhere over the ocean. If something goes wrong, the resulting crash would impact only the test spacecraft and its experimental systems. That's why the new heat shield system is crucial, to avoid repeating a tragedy like the 2003 Space Shuttle Columbia disaster when debris was scattered across the United States due to a damaged heat shield. SpaceX wants to ensure that doesn't happen again. By targeting splashdown in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, the descent path ensures that any potential debris will fall safely into the sea if anything fails during re-entry. But let's think positively. Even without a recovery attempt, this launch will still be impressive. And SpaceX certainly isn't short on spacecraft to pursue their ambitious dreams. SpaceX is doing what no other company has been able to achieve. With their current capabilities, all SpaceX needs now is time. Time to refine, test, and perfect every system until they're ready to unlock new possibilities in space. Despite the inherent risks, this second orbital flight of Starship marks another major milestone in the development of the world's most powerful spacecraft. That's all for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching, and see you next time.